also acts as a contributing risk factor for many uh, diseases that affect quality of life. While the individual risk may be quite small from exposure, um, air quality affects large populations, and so the overall risk to the population is quite high. And research has shown that on days where air quality is worse than higher levels of a particular matter and other things, that there's more people who die on average those days. Um, so some of the clear effects that have been proven are mainly respiratory and cardiovascular effects. So some of the respiratory effects include things such as decreased lung development and decreased lung function, uh, exacerbation of asthma and other allergies, as well as COPD and pulmonary fibrosis, as well as increased lung cancer risk. And so indoor biomass emissions have actually been categorized as a 2A horrible carcinogen by IR. Then with the cardiovascular impacts, it also increases rates of heart disease, heart attacks, and strokes. And on top of that, there's many emerging effects that are kind of appearing in new research. And so this can range from things such as effect, causing birth defects and affecting birth weight to affecting cognitive function. In addition to particular matter, there's also, as I mentioned, many other pollutants that can be contained in wood smoke. These things such as like benzene and, and GHs. Um, these may possibly have additive or even synergistic effects, and these are not fully understood how the entire mixture um, impacts health. So several mechanisms have been proposed how these health effects occur, um, and these can range from suggestions of particle-induced particle oxidative stress to genotoxicity and inflammation. Um, and a big factor here as well is so these emissions are really focused within communities about where people live, and this is where uh, susceptible populations also live. So this is where like, uh, children and seniors and people who have pre-existing conditions um, are living, and so they're also exposed to this kind of amplifying. So living here in Canada, most people might think that air pollution is not really a problem and it's quite yeah. clean air, but that's not quite the case. So a study in 2015 uh, identified a log linear exposure response relationship between PM exposure and health effects. So they identified kind of a linear response with lung disease as ambient PM increases, but then with heart disease, it's a kind of a log linear curve. Um, and so therefore, the average between them is log linear, and you end up with this um, quite steep curve at the start here, and so there's a lot of effects in the first, I mean, even at low levels, I should say. Um, and so what that means is if we split the mortality excess in half, um, then a reduction from the right-hand side here of the, uh, the highest PM levels all the way down to halfway here on the y-axis, uh, be quite a significant decrease in mortality, but continuing to decrease um, even lower is giving us exactly the same amount of um, benefit in terms of reducing mortality. So there's definitely benefit in still working. Okay, is that working better, Joseph? Right. Um, so basically the point is that even if you get down to low levels, the Continuing to decrease air quality is definitely going to have more um, impacts on reducing mortality as, as a result. So how does this match up with kind of limits in BC? So the BC annual standard for uh, PM2.5 is there an annual average of 8 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and then there is a 24-hour average of 25 um, micrograms per cubic meter. So these are exceeded in a number of communities. Um, and so there's definitely room to continue to improve air quality to continue to reduce mortality as a result. So wood smoke is a major driver of uh, air quality patterns in BC during the winter. And there's a number of reasons why that's the case. So first of all, wood smoke is very prevalent. Um, it's an available resource. Uh, it's seen as relatively affordable um, and reliable in terms of if there's other issues of power that maybe you can still heat with wood. Um, it's seen as traditional, and it's also seen as fairly renewable. And then another issue is the emissions proximity. So if you think of a typical kind of stereotype of pollution, you picture one large smokestack um, spewing a, a large amount of emissions. The difference here is instead of one large smokestack, this is lots of very low levels, so small amounts of pollution from each individual chimney, but lots of these directly within a community right where people live. Um, 
And then this is kind of multiplied by the fact that most communities in the province are in a valley where there's a tendency for inversions to form. So quickly to demonstrate how that works, so typically the normal situation at the top here, um, surface air is hotter than the air above, and hot air rises, as most people know, so that we get atmospheric mixing here, and the smoke can diffuse away. But in a situation where a warmer air layer comes above, so either this can be blown in above, or the surface air can cool faster than the area above, which is quite common during the winter, um, this air can be trapped, so it comes up to this warmer air and it can't pass through, and so it's, it stops this upward mixing, and it gets trapped below. Um, and due to the topography as well, we have a lot of situations where Thunder Valley is also limited horizontally, so this can really trap in the smoke and it can build up the right where people are living. So an example of this, here's a photo from, uh, it's an example in Scotland where there's this single smoke source rising up and it's hitting this higher temperature boundary and instead of continuing to, to rise higher and spread out, it's being trapped and spreading horizontally and settling over the community. Um, as you can see, this is having a much bigger impact than if it continued to rise away from people. So how does Woodsburg measure up um, in BC as a source of PM? In the 2014 emissions inventory, it was found that uh, residential wood combustion accounts for more, um, sorry, is the highest anthropogenic source of PM2.5 other than road dust. So this exceeds emissions from all construction, uh, from all industrial sources, as well as from all uh, transport emissions, so that's ground and marine vessels. The only anthropogenic emission source that would um, exceed this even further if it was from this scale is, is forest fires. So if you decide to include those, it would obviously dwarf this. Um, but from an anthropogenic perspective, it's really the biggest uh, emitter after road dust. So I've note here, compared to these, these other categories, they said even it's higher than these categories here, construction and transport, etc. cetera. Um, wood burning is effectively fairly unregulated. So these other sources have been dramatically reduced over the last uh, decades. And this is due to regulations and improvements in technology and other things, but there's been much less action on wood smoke. Um, I'm not advocating directly for regulation, but there, there needs to be an effort to manage um, this source through a combination of regulatory and non-regulatory approaches. Um, and so that's moving into how can you manage uh, wood smoke pollution. So first, firstly, I'm going to mention regulations. So in BC, um, there's been regulations for over 20 years now that limit the type of wood burning stoves that can be, can be sold. Um, these have been recently strengthened, so this isn't just a, a static thing, um, but it's limiting it to low emission, like higher technology stoves. Um, other options for, sorry, to, to expand on that, some other communities have gone further, and so on a municipal level have passed other regulations. So for example, um, Duncan on Vancouver Island has passed a sort of regulation where when a house is sold, older stoves can't be kept in the house, they have to be removed, and if a, if a homeowner wants to then have a stove, they have to buy a new low emission stove, they can't keep the old uh, stove that pollutes more. Um, other possible options for regulations include things such as burn limits, so potentially if the marching levels are above uh, regulations, then they can limit uh, burning on those days. And other options for management include things such as exchange programs, so the 17 um, currently active exchange programs in BC, so this is exchange of stoves, and so there's a, you know, kind of a financial incentive or financial support for changing from an older stove to a newer stove um, that produces less emissions. Um, and so this chart here kind of shows that, and so since 2008, is the most recent data I could find, but up until the end of 2014, there's been over 6,000 uh, stoves exchanged in BC, so that's quite a significant amount, and hopefully that continues, I'm sure this will continue to rise. Um, and finally, to add to that, I think one of the most important things here is education, um, because it really doesn't matter how good your stove is. So if you, obviously it, it, it's better, um, but if you exchange every stove in BC, if people have bad burning practices and, and burn wet wood, for example, this is really going to outweigh their effect of the stove, um, and you're still going to produce a lot of smoke. And so education is important to teach people how to minimize smoke. Um, 
found that a lot of municipalities and areas are hesitant to kind of increase regulation or adopt new um, new management efforts until we have more empirical evidence to show that smoke is really what is driving the air quality of these areas. So mentioning those exchange programs here, this is kind of comparing uh, different burning options. So the worst case is obviously the is burning in a fireplace, which is, is almost the same as just open burning. Um, this is obviously the least advanced method and produces the most emissions. And if you move to a wood stove, it's more contained. Um, it's typically going to burn at a higher temperature. Um, and you get slightly closer to complete combustion of the fuel and therefore less smoke. And then if you move to a newer um, wood stove, so this is, is wood stoves are certified by the EPA to be low emissions. These have uh, other features that kind of reduce the smoke even further, such as maybe recirculating the smoke through the fire and burning more of the particulates. So basically reaching closer to complete combustion avoiding releasing less smoke. Um, another option is, is pellet stoves, which is a good option to remove kind of waste. So waste wood can be converted into pellets. Um, and then pellets, because they have a very high surface area, get a lot closer to being completely burned and release less smoke um, while, when combusted. Um, so the values on this, this image here may be slightly out of date, so uh, um, there has been new regulations kind of passed by the EPA and other groups to, to manage what is a low emission stove. Um, and so these could both be lower now, but they're still not going to be as high, uh, sorry, not going to be as low or as clean as alternative options to completely replacing using wood as a, as a fuel source. Um, obviously, the cleanest option is electric heat, especially in um, British Columbia, where the majority of our power comes from um, hydropower, so a few upstream emissions. So, what is currently done to monitor air quality in BC is, and its effect? Um, there's an air quality monitoring network across the province that is, is managed by the BC Ministry of Environment. It manages, sorry, it measures um, PM2.5 as well as the criteria air pollutants is now dioxide and ozone, um, and often climate variables, and it's located in all of the, uh, most of the large communities in the province, so it's not in every community, but a lot of communities do have monitoring stations. Um, the data is updated and available hourly, um, so you can log into the website and literally see their the current data. Um, and so this is just a screenshot of sometime last week when I took a picture um, of the current situation. Um, and so there's very low levels during this time, so the blues are the lowest two categories. So everything here is, is roughly below 10 micrograms. Um, this map would have looked significantly different if you looked at it earlier in the summer when we had the worst forest fire season of record. Um, but also in the winter, you're going to see areas that will be much darker and more red and things in certain areas during certain periods. So this marching network is invaluable. It's extremely useful data, but there is some limitations to it. Um, the first major one that I'm going to highlight here is there's, there's no routine uh, source specific information. So the instruments that are chosen in these sites are put in to monitor, um, as I mentioned, the criteria air pollutants. And this is mainly because this is what the targets are set for and regulations are created to control. Um, and there's no information on, on what could be producing those pollutants. So for example, it could identify that a community is having issue with really high levels in a particular manner, but it can't provide information on what is potentially causing um, those high levels. Secondly, um, is, is limited spatial resolution to this, to the margin network. So from an economic standpoint, it's simply not feasible to install communities in every single community across the province. Um, it takes a lot of staff and money to keep them maintained and keep them running. And on top of that, as well as in every community, um, there's also limitation you can't put multiple stations within a community. Um, and so effort is taken to ensure the location of each station is kind of representative of the air shed, but there's always going to be differences across an area. Um, and so the station may be biased high or low to the actual effects seen around the community. This spatial issue is extremely important, especially for wood smoke, and it's burned, um, sorry, it's because in small communities where they may be lacking these, these uh, monitoring stations, these areas that that wood, is even, wood burning is even more prevalent and is, is more prefer preferentially burned. And as I mentioned, the difference within the community is important because there's so many of these small individual sources within a community. Um, there's a lot of variability depending on who uses or who 
who doesn't use a stove, um, and then the quality of the stove they're using, their burn habits, all that sort of thing. So, for example, if you have a neighbor who, who has really bad um, burning practices or uses a poor quality stove, it's likely that you're going to be more exposed than someone potentially even on the same street as you, um, even like even more so than across the town. Um, so there's big differences spatially. So to talk about how we can start to address those knowledge gaps, um, this algorithm is one uh, option to do that. So this algorithm was dealt as some project work by some collaborators of the project. It was they developed the algorithm, um, sorry, to try to address the source issue here. Um, the algorithm systematically identifies smoky days by using the PM2.5 and temperature data from the marching sites. So it's a useful complement to uh, the marching sites, but it can only be applied in those communities that have stations. And it works by estimating um, the relative smoke, relative smokiness of the community by looking for common diurnal and seasonal patterns. And this plot here on the left is an example of this, and it shows a community that is, is highly impacted by wood smoke. And the x-axis shows the months of the year, so it's it's organized so that the winter is in the center here. Um, and then the hours of the day on the y-axis is split into two-hour periods. Um, and then each cell is shaded by the average within that time period in that month, um, and just colored on a relative level. And so there's two patterns here, as I mentioned. So the, first of all, the seasonal patterns, there's going to be in a community that's affected by wood smoke, there's going to be more darker colors in the center in the winter. Um, and there's also a diurnal pattern, so people are more likely to be at home in the morning and the evening. They potentially are at work during the day, so there's this clearer band in the middle. They come home, potentially fire up the stove to heat the house, and you get more emissions over the, the evening and into the morning. Um, and then some heating in the morning as well, potentially before going to work when the stove is not as active. Um, so the thing to look for really is the combination of the two gives this kind of hourglass shape here. Um, and that's how we identify this. The results of this work, so it, this algorithm allows us to rank communities, and so it can prioritize communities by impacts. This doesn't only help research and the policymakers to select communities for things such as focus sampling studies, like I'm going to explain but also things such as emissions reduction strategies. Um, it can also be used to inform at-risk municipalities um, of objective evidence to, to support that their community is impacted by wood smoke, and this could lead to increased public and government interest um, in the adoption of cleaner clean technologies. So another um, option here for, for adding more evidence for wood smoke uh, impacts in terms of kind of a, a more field measurement and is the, the option of levofloxacin, which is a very commonly used chemical tracer. So it's kind of the most mostly the most commonly used chemical marker of wood smoke. Has been used extensively in a lot of research. It's a sugar anhydride, which is produced from the pyrolysis of cellulose, which effectively means it's being produced as cellulose burns um, in biomass. And it's useful because it's emitted in really high levels when wood is burned and other biomass is burned, but it's also stable in the atmosphere, so you can sample it after combustion has happened, but it is an expensive process, so it requires collecting samples for at least 24 hours, and then there's expensive lab analysis following up with that, so if you wanted, so you can't really do any spatial marching with this unless you had a very large budget and you can put lots of samples in the community. Um, and in terms of the second knowledge gap there, so the limitation of, of spatial re resolution, um, one option to address that is, is mobile monitoring. So this typically consists of operating continuously reading nephilometers, which are instruments which provide real-time estimations of PM levels in a vehicle that is driven on a predetermined route around a community, and then this data is matched with GPS measurements taken at the same time, so you can match each reading from the instrument with where it was recorded. Um, for example, if you're interested in wood smoke, you can then target when you do this monitoring, so you could do this monitoring during the evenings when you expect wood smoke to really dominate the, the PM source. Um, and these are just some examples of previous work done by our group and others. So an example here is some monitoring in Vancouver in 2007, and then on the right is some monitoring by the University of Victoria that was in Comox Valley during 2009. Um, and also there was some work done in Smithers at the Bulkley Valley area. It was before and after a wood stove exchange program, and that was kind of to evaluate the effect 
have it upgrading stoves really had an impact on air quality in there. So now, finally time to talk about my project. Um, so we worked to create a method to address these two knowledge gaps, and that was done by combining mobile monitoring to address the spatial resolution with a new um, a new generation of Apolometer, which is a type of instrument um, which can provide more information uh, than just the kind of overall level of PM2.5. Additional instruments were also used um, at the fixed site, so by the measurement environment stations to kind of complement those, those measurements, also to compare our instruments with theirs. Um, and I test this method in three identified communities. So these are three communities that are identified using the algorithm I mentioned. Um, that have monitoring stations, and then three communities that were close to these communities that didn't have any previous monitoring. And this is to see if this would be a good way to really kind of evaluate the air quality in those areas. So I mentioned two instruments here, um, and these are the two that we used during during the project. And they're both continuous monitoring optical instruments, and they can both be used in a mobile monitoring um, setup. In the past, the nephilometer has really been the main focus for measuring spatial patterns of PM. Um, and it kind of estimates a total amount of, of particular matter. And so the way it works is it draws air through a sealed drop container. So this is an image of the interior of the instrument. Um, you can kind of see this black tube here. So this is sealed and air is drawn through it. And um, it's sealed from any other light source as well. And then it shines a single light source through the air sample and measures the amount of light that is scattered um, away from the, the middle. Um, and this, this is kind of a measure of, of visibility, and so as I said, like PM is, is causing that scattering, and it's causing that haziness that you see with smoke, and so that's how it, it's measuring it, and it's also been shown to be very well correlated with other measures of, of total PM. Um, so that was the kind of the purpose of using the nephilometer. Um, and then in addition to this, we also are using the apolometer, as I mentioned, which is different, and then it, it draws air through a size-specific inlet, first of all, which, which filters out anything bigger than 2.5 microns, so we only gain the PM2.5, and deposits that onto a filter tape. So this is, again, is an image of the inside of the instrument, and there's a filter tape here with these bands. So each band is, is where PM2.5 is being deposited onto the tape. Um, it then shines multiple wavelengths of light, which is kind of the key part here, through this this filter tape and the sample and measures the change in absorbance of each wavelength over time. So each second it changes, it measures how much has changed since the previous second of each uh, wavelength. And then when it gets too dark, so there's too much PM on the tape, it moves on and, and chooses a clean spot on the tape um, to monitor. So kind of expand on this and explain how that's working, why it tells us more about the uh, source of the PM. This is an image from a recent paper that was by a group, including George Allen, who has really pioneered a lot of the work developing the use of apolometers for measuring wood smoke. And so as I said, the apolometer measures the absorption of PM on a filter tape, and it does this at multiple uh, wavelengths. So the two wavelengths we're interested in is the 880 nanometers here, which is known as BC, which stands for black carbon, um, and then the 370 nanometer wavelength, which is known as UVC, um, and is measuring kind of the ultraviolet absorption by these um, by these samples. So the key difference is is, the, is how these wavelengths can change with different sources. So in biomass combustion, um, PM so PM is, is coming from biomass combustion. UV absor absorbing compounds are, are really enriched in that source compared to other sources. So for example, in transport, there's very little of those of those compounds, and so in this this plot here on the right hand side is an example of where the apolometer is used uh, exclusively with a diesel generator as a, a PM source of the test. Um, and you can barely even see the differences between the wavelengths. They're all completely on top of each other and there's, there's very low differences. Whereas on the left, this is using a, uh, a wood fire as a source. And you can really see the differences between wavelengths here, um, where the UV band is absorbing a lot more than the black carbon band. And so this difference here, highlighted by the blue line, is what's known as delta C. And that's our, our measurement, really, that's uh, well correlated with wood smoke. So how did I do this in terms of mode monitoring? So it's kind of as simple as it sounds by putting this in a 
vehicle. It was like, so let's put it on the back seat and get the inlet tubes were placed out of the window and attached to the vehicle. Um, they were attached on the side opposite to the exhaust of the car just to kind of limit our own emissions affecting the instruments. Um, and then also a GPS, as I mentioned, is used in the front to collect location data and then after we compare the measurements with the location data. Um, both instruments are measuring every second, and so it's it's really high measure resolution. So I can literally get a measure every second as I'm driving, and I'm driving at low speed, so I can get a measurement in short distances. And then this is the fixed side to the other aspect. So this is a photo from Whistler. Um, when I was there, there was a lot of digging involved in this work uh, to clear out the ground for the instruments. So the main container here is the housing for the Ministry of Environment equipment, and these are the inlets on the top. Um, on the right here is a plasma case, plasma case containing the nephilometer that was paired to the mobile instrument, and then under the tarp is another case containing an um with the inlet up here attached to the side of the housing. Um, and so these are to give us comparison to the mobile instruments. And then there's also two other cases here which, which had um, carbon impacted in, collecting gravimetric samples. So that's with a filter tape and it's collecting actual samples of the PM. Um, and they were measured later to see how much PM was deposited on the filter, but also to see um, used for the level of analysis. So how did we choose the communities? So the, as I said, the, the algorithm work was really used to identify the communities. Um, this is an image of all the kind of communities that were ranked based using this algorithm, and they're ranked based on how smoky they are on the results of the algorithm. And so the, the most smoky in this example is Houston, and the smoky is Kamloops. And so you can really see this hourglass pattern in the first few examples, and it kind of starts to slowly break down as you get further down. Um, so our first community we picked was Whistler, and that's mainly because it's like a local community that for the initial testing. back there, and there's a lot of interest in the area, and so the paired community with that one that was unmarked was chosen as Pemberton. Then the second one chosen as an island community was um, Courtney, um, and paired with that was Cumberland, and then Vanderhoof was chosen as our northern community, and so you might be wondering why Houston wasn't chosen, um, and that's mainly because there's been marching work done around Houston previously, but also there's no, it wasn't really a close community with it, and so we chose Vanderhoof um, and Fraser Lake, and there was a lot of interest as well by the Mission Environment to get some data on Vanderhoof and Fraser Lake, so that's why the three sets of communities were chosen. To explain the monitoring campaign briefly, so each each community pair was monitored for two weeks, so the fixed site was set up for two weeks um, at the Mission Environment Station, and then I planned the routes ahead of time, so the routes were kind of drawn around the community to to cover as much of the um, populated areas as possible, and then I have some community feedback to kind of tweak them and, and make them better. Um, and then having these pre plans allows me to repeat exactly the same route every night. Each night I then alternated between the two routes, so between the monitored community, for, for example, Whistler, and then the second night I would do the unmonitored community, so Pemberton, and this is to kind of limit weather impacts. For example, if you did them one week and then the other week, the first week could be really cold, and all your Whistler data could be doing a cold uh, scenario, and then everything could be the next week, and it might not be in the same condition. So to try and limit that, we did them on alternating nights. And then routes were also driven in alternating directions, so I wouldn't be measuring the same spot at the same time every night. Um, so somewhere earlier in the evening, maybe bias lower, and later in the evening, maybe bias higher. So to try and avoid that, we, we alternated the direction of the route. And so a quick cover of the data analysis went to this. So a lot of analysis is I've conducted. Um, I'm just going to quickly explain the mobile analysis in terms of how the maps were made. Um, the first step, obviously, is just cleaning the data from the instruments and then matching them, as I said, to the GPS coordinates to give a location to each, each record. Then this kind of produced, obviously, um, in the top graph here, a kind of um, log normal distribution, which is to be expected with environmental data where there's no real zero, there's lots of low readings and then there's less readings as you get higher. Um, and to to be able to convert to Z scores, um, we normalize this data just by taking a log, which is the second distribution here, um, and then convert them to Z scores. And so the reason 
to use that squirrel is to extract the spatial pattern here and kind of try to remove the other differences between the trips um, and then allow us to average between trips and average just the pattern and not the, the other variables that may be affecting it. Um, to quickly explain explain what a z score is, if you want to understand, a z score is the number of um, standard deviations away from a population mean. So the bottom distribution here is the z score distribution, so it's exactly the same distribution as the data it's calculated on, um, but the x-axis values here have changed. So zero now refers to the mean of this distribution, um, and 95% of the data should fall between within two standard deviations. So between minus two here and positive two, most of the data is within that area. Now, after this step, each record now has a location and a z-score assigned to it. Um, and I created raster grids to cover um, the areas of interest. So to cover, for example, all of Whistler and Pemberton. And each cell would have um, an area of 33 uh, square meters. And then each record that fell within those cells was averaged. So um, for every cell, every record that fell within one location was averaged together. And these were spatially smoothed using a technique called focal smoothing. Then the final value of those cells represent um, a smoothing of, of the area of the nine cells surrounding. So this is a square area of 100 square meters. Um, and that's what was used to produce these maps. Time to talk about the results themselves. Um, to quickly compare the communities, and just from this is just showing the filter measurements that I mentioned on the side of the fix set there. This is showing the the PM measurements on those filters on the x-axis and the level glucosan on the y-axis. They're so kind of trying to get at the amount of wood smoke influencing the PM. Um, we found there's, there's sorry, there's four so there's 14 measurements for each each site here. Um, and then we found pretty high correlation, well, very high correlation between all of the sites here showing that wood smoke is a dominant site source. Whistler and Courtney here have the highest, um, and we expect that wood smoke is dominating those areas. Vanderhoof had a much lower uh, R squared and also a lower slope, which is the green line here. Um, and this is potentially for a number of reasons. One explanation is when I was in Vanderhoof, there was a, a large impact by road dust. So in colder climates around Province. There's a lot of um, traction material deposited on roads during the winter, and then when the snow melts, all this traction material is kind of exposed on the surface, and a lot of it gets kicked up by traffic. And this kind of happened almost a week right as I got there, so there was a lot of road dust events happening, and so there's other sources of PM um, that we were very clear while we were there. And so this is a kind of backdrop to this: is about 10% of the PM was coming from level of um, and then around uh, 3 to 4 percent coming from that. In terms of evaluating the two instruments, or two methods for getting at wood smoke, so the alpha-ometer is on the x-axis here, which is the delta-c measure that I quickly explained, and then on the right is this level of descent, sorry, on the left here on the y-axis is the level of descent again on the filters. Um, there's extremely high correlation here between all of them, so the lowest is a R squared of 0 0.945. Um, so this shows that the alpha really is measuring wood smoke because we're comparing it to level wood smoke, which I think we said is kind of seen as a gold standard for measuring wood smoke. Um, but it does raise some questions as well because the, the relationship is not quite consistent between the communities. So Whistler and Vanderhoof look very similar here, but um, the corn is a lot steeper. Um, there could be many reasons for why that is happening. So level of may be released differently at, at different temperatures or based on the type of wood being burned or moisture content. Um, but that's just a huge question for other uh, research. Then to compare the instruments, so the two instruments I explained that are used in the mobile monitoring, these are time series from two monitoring runs. So one is during the day in Fraser Lake um, and one is the following night. And so as I, ex as I mentioned, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of road dust impacting the PM. Um, while I was up there. And so because of that, the, so the nephilometer, as I said, is, is responding to total PM. And so there's these large spikes, which there's a lot of traffic during the day when I was driving these areas. There's a lot of highway sections of the Fraser Lake route. And so there's a lot of road dust episodes. And so that instrument is really picking these up. Um, and the nephilometer really isn't responding to that, which is a good sign that it's, it's not responding to other things that aren't wood smoke. 
Um, whereas compared to the, at night, where there's much less traffic, so I was driving these routes um, from 9 p.m. onwards, there's a lot less traffic on the route, um, therefore a lot less road dust being uh, kicked up to be measured, and there's a lot more correlation between them, so the Athlon is, is following the, the Athlon quite closely here. Um, so just to clarify, the Athlon is the red line here. Uh, yeah. In terms of looking at um, some of the maps here, this is just to start off with to show some of the variability in individual routes. Um, these maps show the Nephilimna data for the first two trips on the Courtney and Cumberland route. So the raster cells were categorized and shaded based on bins of that scores that were 0.5 wide. Um, so for example, any measurement falling in this, in this area here is between zero and 0.5 standard deviations away from the mean. Um, and then these were kind of converted into an estimate of PM2.5, just to kind of give some context to what these, these colors may represent. So this really shows the variability across the route. So within one trip, there's a lot of difference in different areas. It kind of shows the importance for doing this spatial um, mapping here. And then there's also quite a lot of difference between nights. So for example, there's, there's some areas that are low one night and then are high other nights. And so that's why you want to do this multiple times and average the patterns to kind of get at what's really going on. So we look at the first um, root pair comparison. These maps, as I said, show the Z scores, um, but this is an average of all the night trips on uh, the two weeks I was there. So these PM estimates are calculated for just during this period. So this is 9 p.m. to um, around midnight or 1 p.m. at uh, 1 a.m. Sorry. Uh, to kind of, so as I said, Z scores are a representative term relative to the distribution they calculated on, and so to try and make it fair, areas we removed that that weren't representative or were of interest, I would say. So the entire highway section between Whistler and Fenton was removed. So no one effectively lives there, and these are very low levels. And so if that was included in the distribution, we would really bias things higher. Um, and so that was removed prior to the calculation of the Z-scores. Um, and so just a disclaimer, this is only seven nights of data in each in each route. Um, but it does start to draw out reoccurring patterns between the trips. For example, here there's very few homes on the west side of the lake in Whistler, and so there's less stoves and less emissions, and so it does kind of show the patterns that you would expect to see. For example, this area at the bottom here is was built for the Olympics, and so it's very new homes, very few stoves, and very low levels that we measured while I was there. Um, and then older areas of the community, for example, up here, um, are seeing higher levels where there's more stoves. So it is in kind of all the patterns that you would expect. Um, and looking in terms of the unmonitored community, so Pemberton, as I said, doesn't have any previous data. But these levels are at least as high, if not higher, in certain areas compared to Whistler. Um, so that's an interesting finding. And you can really see that there, there's a lot of spatial variability around the area. So the main part of Pemberton here, um, and out to Mount Curry and other areas further east. Um, look at the Comox Valley routes. There's so it was typically much higher values while I was see while I was there. Um, there was actually two air quality warnings um, while I was in the area, and so this is when the levels passed 25 uh, micrograms as a, as a 24 average. So this is kind of like a worst case scenario. Um, but these maps are a combination of the two routes, so it's really drawing out the spatial patterns, but relative to their own route. So the two routes I, I drove were kind of either side of the river and the and the bay here. Um, so Courtney and Cumberland, and then from the fixed site at the monitoring station out in the, in the area of Comox. Um, and just to have a, a quick look at this, so the Cumberland area is unmonitored, but there's relatively high values there, um, and, and comparable to monitored areas such as in Courtney. Um, I didn't mention uh, the station on the previous map, but this is where the monitoring station is located, so this blue dot here, and so it falls um, quite high on the distribution here, so a Z score of 0 0.76, so it's higher than uh, the average of this entire route. But as I said, that's the entire route is only relative to the route itself, so it's including areas that aren't populated. Um, and the PM score looks extremely high, um, but again, this is worst case scenario when during, during when there was air quality warnings on, um, but it does start to give us some extra information on, on the pattern across the community. Um, Let's compare that back to the Whistler example. Uh, the Whistler station here is falling 
the results were almost exactly on the mean and everything. Um, so it is kind of fairly representative of the entire pattern, but the it raises the question there and it kind of raises the value of this station one thing. Even though that's on the mean, there's other areas that can really be much higher or much lower and it might not be representing those areas and the people who live there. Um, looking at Vanderhoof, uh, these are the patterns for the Vanderhoof route, which is the main image here. Um, and then the Fraser Lake and Fort Fraser, which is on the way, uh, was, was inserted here. Um, again, there's long highway sections in this route going out to Fraser Lake, so they were removed prior to the Z-Squirrels calculation. Um, and then these patterns seem to follow a lot of the more, more densely populated areas of the region. Um, and the fixed site here seems to have a lower Z-score, so this is <coughs> point, uh, negative 0.9. So this is lower than the average. Um, so it's not quite representing the other patterns in the area while we were there again. Um, this could be for another factors and around the area is a lot of, it's kind of an area with uh, industrial buildings, commercial buildings, and high school still activity directly near the, the morning station. Um, but it just kind of gives you an example of how the station data may or may not represent an entire community like this, um, and what homes in certain areas may be exposed to. Um, so, some conclusions on the methods used. Uh, the method is definitely able to, to bring out some spatial patterns in the region and complement the monitoring station data. Um, it's relatively quick and easy to use, and it definitely is going out and identifying these hotspots, uh, which can then be used to prioritize these areas for kind of targeting wood stove exchanges or um, combining with further research, that sort of thing. It's also a quick option to use in unmonitored communities to kind of get some quick data on what they may be exposed to relative to monitored communities. Um, in terms of the instruments, the high correlation between the two instruments overall during the night runs, and this shows that there is a lot of uh, wood smoke really dominating the, the PM source during those nights that we were monitoring. Um, and with this high correlation, we don't know if there's much value in using the Athlon, but we, again, we chose these communities because we expect them to be dominated by um, wood smoke. Um, and finally, as, as kind of a disclaimer, this only be really considered as semi-quantitative data. Uh, the ideal situation would be a, a being able to monitor everywhere simultaneously, but this is obviously not possible. Um, and so other effects are, are coming in here because you're not monitoring at the same time. Um, and so we've used methods to try and limit that, so the Z scores, etc. Uh, but these are really relative to where you draw the route. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. And so this is just kind of trying to do the best we can with uh, what's available. Um, some takeaways uh, from that. So as I said, the mobile is really providing high spatial resolution data, and that really complements the marking stations can be used in the future to target things. Um, the correlation with the level of has really showed the ethnometer is, is definitely measuring wood smoke, which is which is good. Um, and then the relationship between the ethnometer and the ethnometer is showing that wood smoke is really dominating uh, the air quality patterns in these communities during the winter. Um, I'm now working on presenting these results, results to the communities. And this is to inform them of our findings, but also so then the data can inform um, developments in local communities. And then this equipment and the method will be available to use in other communities and other products. Um, and so that's kind of wrapping up um, my talk. So hopefully uh, it was interesting for you. And I want to thank you for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, you can just hold on to the mic and I'll pass this around. Um, going to be, our remote listeners can, can hear us. So thank you very much, Matt, um, for this um, walk through your um, research work, which was very interesting. Um, and we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Um, we do have some questions from our um, remote listeners. Um, and I'm going to start with that, and then I'll take questions here. So, um, Stephen Sue is asking um, if you know of any studies that have looked at uh, the wildfires impact during this summer. Um, I don't know of any studies personally. Um, it's obviously quite short term to be uh, any results of that coming out if it is being done. 
Um, which I'm sure it is. As it was the worst uh, forest fire season in, uh, in the province's recorded history. But there's quite a big difference in forest fires. So this comes up quite a lot. The difference between forest fire smoke and residential wood smoke. So forest fire smoke, this summer was kind of different, but typically it's usually a short-term exposure at really high levels. So communities will be exposed for a week or two. Um, whereas residential wood smoke is the most of the winter is a low level of low relative to forest fire smoke for the over the entire winter. It's more of a chronic exposure there. Okay, so um, the next question that we have. So um, the next question that we have from our remote listeners is about, um, can you please comment on, um, um, tell us when the results will be publicly available? Um, I'm working on, on presenting those results to the communities. Um, hopefully in the next, within the next month, they'll be presented to the communities. Um, and from there, hopefully they should be publicly available from that point. Okay, maybe you covered this, but I missed it. Um, did you decide when to monitor based upon that like distribution that you showed earlier with the uh, like the square grid thing? You could see that like in December, January was the most intense month. Did you was that how you did it? I didn't catch that. Uh, yes, it was, it was kind of two factors. So yeah, it was in the height of winter. Um, so the monitoring was done between um, the start of January and the end of February. Um, so those two months, the kind of the coldest months of the year, and, and when people are more likely to be burning. Yeah. Okay, so you were trying to capture like a more intense period. Yeah, of exactly. Year. So we were, okay. we were targeting that um, in terms of the coldest months, but also doing the trips mostly at night when we expect wood to dominate, and, and to try to map like the wood smoke impacts and really target that. And then one more quick thing. Sorry, everyone. Uh, when you cut some of the like transportation on highways out of your scoring. Mm -hmm. I guess my question was, did you plan that in advance? Because if you're doing that only as you're looking at the data, it seems slightly like you're just deciding what data to use. Um, the reason for cutting that is um, it wouldn't be cut necessarily if you were looking at a map of the values, like the raw values. Oh, um, right. The reason is the calculating the z-score. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So the z-score is relative to the distribution. So if you included that and excluding the issue with the road dust, most of the highway sections are very low levels. Um, and so that and that would literally bias the distribution much higher, and all these those scores would look really high. But if you did a map with just PM concentration, then you could leave it all in there. Yeah, exactly. There would be no issue really there. It would just show the actual patterns. Um, for the PM25 data, did you compare your data collected to um, those live maps that you can find online of PM25? Uh, yeah, so I don't, I didn't have it included in here just for, for the sake of time. Um, I did a lot of analysis of our fixed ideas. So as I said, there was the the two instruments paired next to the Ministry of Environment um, data in each community. Um, I kind of showed the just the aspect of the filter comparison, but obviously we can also compare the acetylometer that was there next to the, the site to the, the BAM, which is the, the instrument that the ministry uses for monitoring PM. Um, but there was there was very high correlations. The instruments were reading quite similarly. Yeah. Um, Great presentation. And um, I wonder, have you looked at the wood smoke-related symptoms in those four areas uh, reported by local residents? Um, I haven't looked at them. Uh, this was focused on like, the air quality aspect. Um, one of the things I mentioned about these maps could then potentially be used in the future um, to kind of compare to that sort of thing. So when I mentioned uh, the previous mobile monitoring work, so the example of the Smithers. Uh, work that was matched, so there was no monitoring at the same time as some uh, 
help research done, and then they try to match uh, the patterns of the PM in the community to the patterns of the health effects and see um, how that how that affected. Okay. Uh, so Stephen has a question the online audience. Uh, did you find a strong correlation between PM2.5 concentration and wind speed? Um, I have looked at the, the differences between like, climate variables and the PM2.5, but we were there for a very short period of time, um, and I haven't looked at an hourly comparison like that. Um, kind of try to avoid the, the influence there of like, these temperature, like, Sorry, these climate variables such as temperature and wind speed, um, we use the method of, of the Z scores to kind of just extract just the pattern um, and avoid those influences on, on different nights. Um, and then, as I mentioned, when we did the routes, like alternating them and things to try and avoid those. Um, but yeah, that would be something I, I don't have the data right here to show. Thank you, Matt, for today's presentation. We have no more um, questions from our remote listeners. Um, please join me in thanking Matt for his work and his presentation, and we'll see you next week.